won't bite uh -uh. Unless, you like. Unless you like If you smoke, what you smoke? I got the haze. haze And if you're hungry, girl, I got the lace Oh, Ooh, baby, don't keep me waiting There's so much love we could be making Come on. I'm talking kissing, cuddling Rose petals in the bathtub Girl, it's jumping, it's bubbling Hello everyone, a very good evening to all. Thank you for joining us for this very special event organized by SPEKL Young Professionals as well as uh, Sapura Energy. My name is Liam Lim and I am the host for tonight. So tonight, we, what we have is an exclusive live stream from Rick Crew on the semi-sub drilling tender Sapura Esperanza. Before we start, I would like to invite everyone to introduce themselves as well as chat in the chat room and you can um, network around as well as mingle with everyone as, as we, we would normally do in an event. But since this is a virtual event, uh, we would have to do it in this manner. So moving forward, I would like to a brief everyone about SPE and what we have today is actually part of our Young Professionals Energy Connection series. So what this is, is a technical knowledge sharing session where we normally invite speakers from the industry. And uh, for this year, so since there's, we are going through a pandemic, so we thought it, it would be very interesting to hear from Rick Crew themselves how the pandemic has affected the way they work on the rig. And this is also a rare opportunity for us who have, some of us who have not been offshore to take a look at what it, life is like on the rig. So in the YPECS, attendees will get the chance to, to speak with the speakers as well as fellow attendees and and this event is actually uh, exclusive for SPE members, but for this round, we are opening it to everyone. And we would like to encourage everyone to join as an SPE member, as events after this event will be exclusive to SPE members. So to give you some information about SPE, what you get if you join is, as I've mentioned, uh, you get to join the events for free, as well as there are many other activities that SPE organizes such as mentoring and also seminars, technical seminars, as well as the, before the pandemic, there are many in-person events that are very interesting where we get together and you get to network and meet all, all sorts of people from the industry. And also being uh, an SPE member, you get access to the Journal of Petroleum Technology. And uh, for, for your information, for a young professional, the membership costs 20 USD a year. Moving forward, next would be the student membership, which is free for all students who are currently enrolled in university. So if you are a student, definitely take this chance and get the free membership as you will definitely gain a lot. You, there are many, there are scholarships offered as well as you can join the Petrol Bowl competition. It's a good chance where you can get to, before the pandemic, you can actually, if you win at the national level, you get to travel as uh, one of our members, Hazik, has did before. And he actually is a previous winner of Petrol Bowl. And also another important point of being a student member is that you get access to one petrol, which I myself have, I can attest that it is extremely useful for you when you are um, doing your final year project. And this is useful not only to those who are studying petroleum engineering, but also other, uh, engineer, other engineering courses such as chemical engineering, if 
your final year project happens to do with oil and gas. So next, I would like to invite the SPKL chairperson, Encik Muhammad Abu Bakar, to deliver his opening remarks. Hi, Assalamualaikum. Very good evening. Can you hear me? Good? Yes. All right. Okay. <laughs> so it's a, it's a weekend. <laughs> So, so, so we we should have this uh, session uh, as uh, as you know casual as possible, uh, right? So uh, I don't have any specific uh, opening speech or, or opening remarks, but you know I would like to start with uh, uh, HAC moment, uh, Okay, uh, you know we have been in this pandemic, uh, I think more than a year. I think uh, everybody feels the the i can say the pain and also the change all right so and uh, uh, recently there's there's a lot of talks you know talking about uh, mental health so uh, you know some of the common uh, psychological impact you know in terms of mental health of of this covid-19 you know people talk about depression anxiety stress fatigue demotivation, uh, no mood, you know, to work or low mood, you know, have a sleep difficulty, disruption. So I think this is all, you know, uh, due to the, uh, the changes that we have to go through, you know, due to this very challenging uh, uh, sit sit situation because of this pandemic. Okay, I think uh, everybody are, are safe, stay safe. Uh, especially our friend there at the at the rig, right? <laughs> okay, everybody is good, right? At the rig. So how long? The hope. Hopefully, you are not overstay there. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, you know. So this is this is the platform. You know that that you know. Uh, one of the platform that we can uh, you know get together, keep in touch you know, we can reach to each other so that, you know, it can release a bit, you know, uh, any, any, any stress, any depression, you know. So, uh, speaking up and, and reaching to others is very, very important uh, do, during this kind of situation. Okay, and, and, okay, I'm talking about today's topic, you know, when, when, when I see, when I look at life on the rig, you know, wow, this is very, very, interesting uh, it reminds me when when i joined uh, the oil and gas industry back in 20 uh, 1993 lama dah kan so dah 20 tahun lebih dah kerja so memang the first thing when i joined petronas at that time cakap wow you know when when i nak pergi offshore you know i want to visit the platform i want to go to drilling rigs kan eh? so so yeah uh, we did it within the first year I managed to go uh, to offshore, to the platform and to the rigs, you know, for, for familiarization. Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, and then I also have opportunity to go on the land rig as well. You know, uh, I, I worked in Sudan before in Iraq. So the land rig. So it is very interesting, even though uh, it is very challenging life, <laughs> but it's also interesting life there. But with the, Current pandemic, you know, this is where you know I I, I want our speakers, you know, so, uh, to 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 share. Before the pandemic, you know, the the working in rigs, uh, uh, maybe uh, apa, now now is different. I think in terms of lo logistic, simple is you know people go to offshore, they have to quarantine. For example, coming back also they have to quarantine. So it's basically takes so much of emotional <laughs> punya punya impact to the to the to the apa to the to the crew to the to the staff. I think I I hope the speakers can uh, can 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 talk about it. You know, share your 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 experience. But at the same time, with this kind of challenges, there are also you know, macam dulu kita kerja dekat office. Now, now everybody used to work in, apa, work in, uh, work, work from home. 
So so dulu meeting, you know, we we like to have a face to face. Now meeting, you know, we are okay. We get used to a uh, virtual meeting like this one virtual sharing. So I I think in term of operation in in rig kan. Dulu, you know, maybe remote operation is is not normal. Maybe now uh, remote drilling or remote completion is normal. So so maybe maybe the speakers you know can can uh, touch about that as 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 well because you know I, I think these are the 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 thing when 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 we face with uh, some challenges there's also opportunities you know that you know that that you no know, we, we we can maximize whatever technology that uh, we have to uh, for us to to enable us you know to to still work efficiently All right, so I don't want to take so much time. <laughs> I know we have a very good uh, uh, speakers to share their their experience. So uh, before I I I end my uh, speech, you know, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, up to SPEYP, SPEKL uh, Young Professional Com- Committee for for organizing this uh, uh, sharing session experience uh, uh, session. You know, and and also to the Uh, thank you to the speakers lah from Sapura, you know, Captain uh, Henry T and, and also Peter Witness Foreign, and uh, also Zaha lah as the moder as the moderator, right? Okay, all right. So thank you very much. I hope we we can have a very uh, interactive or fruitful uh, discussion. Thank you. Back to you, William. Thank you, Mr. Muhammad, for your opening remarks. Without further ado. Let's get started. So Zaha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Liam. Thank you so much, Ahmad. This is a really great opportunity again. Uh, it's a privilege to be here on behalf of the Society of Petroleum Engineers and also uh, Sapura Energy. So I just wanted to say again, um, thank you so much for investing your time with us, especially on a Friday night. Um, I know it's it's not really easy to get into some uh, important uh, topics. During the weekend, but you know we can try to keep it as casual as possible. So I just want to go through a few introductions and give you guys a little bit of a background of myself uh, and my background of my working experience as well. Um, I graduated from the Colorado School of Mines back in 2017 with a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, um, and I also did a minor in drilling engineering. So I actually. Um, I joined the oil and gas industry a year after I graduated, mainly because at that time there was a downturn in the uh, oil and gas uh, industry. I think it was in 2016, so uh, I was struggling to get into the oil field. Uh, so then um, in 2018, I finally got a, a job offer from Sapura. I found it really attractive, um, and since I've joined, I've I've worked on a, a whole lot of uh, drilling reactivation projects. I think the the exposure was really great. Um, I've worked in uh, semi-tender assisted rigs in 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 Angola, uh, in Namibia. Uh, there are some in Labuan as well. Um, also, I've worked. I work really closely with drilling equipment, drilling programs, uh, supporting uh, drilling operations. And now I'm part of a project management department for my company, which we focus on you know cost-effective uh, driven solutions for drilling projects. So, anyways, yeah, that's enough about me. Um, today also we have an amazing um, panel who are my colleagues as well from Sapura, uh, who as we speak are currently on board a drilling rig. So this is actually a great opportunity to get uh, first-hand insights from them. So next, I'll like to yep, Captain Harry, how are you doing? Hey, good day, good day, everyone. Uh, can you hear me, Zaha? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, my name is Harry Tay. I'm a marine manager for Sapura Drilling. Um, I started my career in 1996 to 2006. I was with a shipping company called APL AT uh, NOL, working on uh, merchant shipping vessels, uh, containers and tanker vessels. And then in 2006, um, I managed to get into the oil and gas industry through uh, uh, to work on one of our semi-submersible drilling tenders, uh, the Sapura Pullout. And uh, from there, I became a BCO, uh, worked my way up to barge captain, and then... Uh, In 2014, an opportunity came for me to go in to become a marine superintendent and rig mover. So I've been moving rigs for our companies for the past uh, five years, uh, eight years or so. Um, and in about three years, two years back, uh, I was promoted to the marine manager of uh, this company. 
So I'm the most senior uh, marine guy for our company in the drilling department. And uh, yep, uh, that's a bit of my introduction. Uh, over to you, Vignes Warren, Peter. Hey, uh, hi to all the uh, fellow members of the SPEKL. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event for giving me an opportunity to share my experience as a recruit. Well, how do I start to be uh, part of the recruit? My ambition beginning, you know, I actually wanted to be a professional footballer, but uh, it didn't go as uh, expected uh, because I'm prone to a lot of injuries, right? So after my high school, uh, took up accounting, uh, complete my uh, association of accounting technician from a local college, and then I start working as a junior auditor. So that was about for two years, and then got myself a job as a finance executive in a manufacturing company. Basically, we're producing uh, medical medical IV bags. Yeah? So, and then I left the job and then joined another holding company as a professional uh, planner. And uh, meanwhile, I did my uh, BA in uh, finance. So, completed, managed to complete that. And this was one day I had, a, you know, having a chat with my buddy and then uh, he was talking all the good stuff of oil and gas industry, right? You know, all the good perks, you know, he influenced me to try to get a job in this line, right? Basically, he only tells the good stuff, yeah. uh, staying in good hotels, amazing foods, you know, well bonuses, going overseas, high hand trainings, you know, all that. And... So I started looking for a job and then I managed to go through rig zone and applied for a job as a document controller. You know, you need to find a way to, to step into the industry, right? So that's what I did and uh, managed to get a call from the company and uh, I got interviewed by the uh, rig manager itself. Uh, he, he was pretty much uh, uh, excited with uh, my background in as, a, as a finance guy and uh, he said, you know, I should... Uh, Start as a job as a rig administrator. Basically, we call it uh, rig cloud, right? rig administrator, right? So that's where my career began. And uh, from 2012 to 2016, I tried to uh, expose myself in uh, with safety and also on the uh, uh, logistic uh, itself. You know, try to expose myself and uh, work my way through and get myself uh, certified with NIOSH and also with the OASH. And finally, the company offered me a job as a STO. So that's me. Back to you, awesome. Zaha. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter and Harry. Um, so right now, just to make sure everyone is aligned, uh, Peter and Harry is currently on board a drilling rig. Um, I am not. I'm actually at home sitting here wearing my coveralls, just trying to wrap with uh, everyone else here. Uh, so how long have you guys been on board the drilling rig, uh, Harry and Peter? Okay. Uh, I joined this rig as it was going through a demop for a rig move. So uh, I think nearly 30 days back, uh, I have been on board for 30 days already. And wow. before that, uh, another 14 days quarantine before we could join this bubble. Uh, they call it the COVID bubble, safety bubble. So myself, about 30, going 45 days now away from home. Peter, what about you? <laughs> <laughs> Currently, I'm the record holder over here on the rig. Uh, 72 days now. Wow. And more days ago. <laughs> That's good. At, at least looking at you now, you look at in a really sane condition. I, I'm really glad that your your, your the, spirits is up. The 10 days to go is uh, unknown actually because uh, <laughs> Lab One, is current, <laughs> Lab One Anchorage is currently going through a lockdown. So everybody in this Lab One Anchorage is currently locked down. No ships, uh, no, no crew changes are allowed uh, until the, uh, they lift the uh, COVID uh, lockdown for this location. Wow. Oh, that that's that's huge. That's that's really long. The longest I've been on a rig was only for fifty days. I think, you know, seventy two days. You know, it's 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 really going to uh, touch base with my mental health as well. But anyways, guys, um, again, um, we were gonna start on the session. Um, now we we'll usually start start with a bit of a safety moment. Usually on the rig, it's a culture to start everything with a safety moment. So I just wanted to give everyone a bit of a, um, a brief through, like imagine that you're going on board a drilling rig right now. Uh, so there are two modes of transportations that we will usually go uh, to the rig. So I'll, I'll let Peter to go through the safety moment because this is usually um, his, his stuff. All right. Uh, thanks, thanks, Zaha. Okay. Uh, first of all, the reason why we're bringing this as a safety moment is that... Uh, over my over the years, as as my experience as a HLO, right, we tend to see uh, 
people are getting excited especially for the newcomers since we are addressing a lot of newcomers on board uh, uh you know, always see they 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 tend to forget you know you know they're not following the instructions and uh, because they are over excited first time being on the rig and uh, i just want to address you know what are the do's and don't uh, that you need to do you know when your guys are arriving on a rig okay so basically for here we have uh, two ways you know either you arrive via the helicopter or you're going to arrive via the uh, fast crew boat right so for the for this region so basically you know when when you're at the heli base make sure you 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 stay focused and listen to what the uh, video has been shown right so it basically it covers all the uh, the safety related stuff that you need to know when when you are in the chopper right basically you've done your post and so on so once you arrive uh, on the rig you know uh, remove your harness once uh, the seat belt light turns off right switch off and then once you get up uh, what we will do is that we will align all the bags for you on the heli deck right so because it's a semi tender or tender rig normally it comes with a heli deck netting right so that could cause a trip hazard for you guys so you need to stay focused on that you know look at the ground and once you step out uh, follow the instruction from the uh, heli deck crew and also the hlo right because we had once uh, the crew when uh, basically passed by the tail rotor right so that really poses a danger and uh, and uh, we need to really watch out for that and then when you're carrying your bags make sure one hand is always free because when you go down the stairs you need to hold the handrail right so that's for the helicopter for the fast crew boat once you arrive at the location there are two ways that you can uh, get to the uh, platform or tender if it's a tender normally we'll leave you using the uh, billy pew transfer right so don up and fasten up your flotation device you know place your carrier items inside the uh, netted baggage right in the middle of the billy pew as you can see from the picture number 3 over there and uh, get into the uh, billy pew basically they will have the footing markings for you you know place your footing markings over there and then uh, cross your hands and uh, hold to the rope if you are scared of heights just don't look down you know just look straight right so we'll lift you and uh, safely will uh, land you on the rig so for the guys who are getting transferred via the rope right so you know give always give a snack for the rope because you know the condition of the rope can't be that good you know some platforms are in great condition some platforms are not so you need to make sure that rope is in really good condition before you transfer yourself right don't don't carry any items you know pass the bags to the uh, boat landing crews they will do that for you to uh, pass the bags to you and as hold as high as possible right hold as high as possible on the rope and then with your knee high swing yourself to the uh, landing area yeah don't uh, see that maybe they are experienced crew over there right and they tend to do it very fast you know you, so you don't just follow them you take your momentum and when you cross uh, make sure you you got the correct timing so that you can cross safely if you don't feel uh, good don't do it wait for your time no worries yeah right. so that's all from me All right thank you so much um Peter again it's it's really good that we have this uh, safety discussion before you know starting our session um so all right uh two weeks ago we had a survey for the general public uh we listened to your survey so basically um this survey was done asking questions from the public to you know draw out some high level themes of what you guys are interested to know about uh life on a drilling rig so we've uh we've made it into five parts basically um the introduction to drilling rig uh the introduction to drilling rigs um the general life on a drilling rig um general safety on board a drilling rig like we mentioned we just touched a little bit um before this on the previous slide uh number 4 is really important the impact of covid-19 um on the drilling rig itself and maybe we will touch base on what the industry is like uh, during covid-19 and number 5 is you know basically a general career advice that myself uh, Peter and Harry can uh, advise to most of our students and even young professionals here we'll keep number 5 as a Q&A session towards the end all right so on part 1 will be the introduction to drilling rigs this will be the most technical uh, part of the whole uh, session so we're just going to have about uh, 20 minutes uh, for 20 minutes sorry about 15 minutes for this uh, part uh, we'll talk about you know what is a drilling rig what type of drilling rigs are there 
uh, how do drilling rigs move from one location to another you know how it's called a mobilization of drilling rig as well uh, who operates the drilling rig you know what is the responsibility of the rig crew and also a very famous question is you know what is a organization chart of a drilling program so yeah uh, without further ado time to add in captain harry to go over the the methodology of the drilling rigs okay yes uh, good day to everyone all right so uh the purpose of a drilling rig um, is to extract oil from subsea uh, or offshore locations. So we have many, many types of uh, drilling rigs. We have uh, drill ships, semi-subs, tenders, uh, jackups. All these have their own purposes, like um, drill ships do exploratory drilling, uh, jackups do shallow shelf drilling, uh, tender and semi-tenders go slightly from the middle to deep sea uh, drilling. Um, and its application generally is uh, we go there, we set up our derrick equipment set, and then uh, we drill. So uh, different rigs have different applications with the jacket platforms or TLP platforms. So let's, let's take a look at what Sapura has to offer the drilling world. Okay, so one of our uh, most basic uh, type is the flat bottom drilling tender. A flat bottom drilling tender is a monohull barge shaped type of tender. We have uh, two cranes. One is a heavy lift crane on the port side. Port means left side for those of you who are non-mariners. Uh, starboard is uh, right hand side. So we got a small crane on the starboard side for uh, cargo handling. Port side will be our heavy lifting crane. So as you can see, uh, as we uh, rig move into location, right, uh, we would drop the rig uh, drop anchors on the rig and uh, hold off at the standoff position at approximately about 100 meters off the platform. And as we are, uh, once we've run all the anchors, midline boys and all, uh, all that is done, we will pull ourselves into the platform. Now, as you can see on the right hand side of that, right, uh, the yellow color parts, yellow color parts, everything that is under the yellow color parts belongs to the clients. That means it belongs to the Shells, the Petronas, the BPs, the Exxons, GX Nippons. They built the jackets. They have the well slots ready. Uh, they already know that this location has oil. But now they need us to come in to drill the oil. So what do we do? In order to get into location, we bring our direct equipment set. Uh, treat us as if we are the main contractor and everything that you see above that uh, Sapura assets, above that line, uh, everything comes with this drilling rig. We go into location to lift this up. We call it heavy lifting operations. We lift it up, rig it up, and then we get ready for drilling operations. All right, uh, can we go to the next slide? Another one of our assets is the semi-submersible drilling tender. Now, how this differs from the uh, flat bottom tenders is, as you can see, there are six columns and two pontoons. Uh, it's like a catamaran, okay? The, the, one of the main differences between the uh, semi-sub and the flat bottom tender is seawater ballasting capacity. So the seawater ballasting capacity allows this rig to operate in a wider draft range. When I say a wider draft range means what? Um, some platforms are very tall, very high. Some platforms are very low. So when you want that sort of a range uh, of uh, I, I need something that can uh, drill at 50 feet or 40 feet. How can we do that? So the drilling rig uh, like this, right? It has an operating range of 9 meter draft all the way to 15 meter draft, which makes it a very uh, stable uh, platform. So uh, let's go to the next slide to see the main uh, difference between these two rigs. Now the flat bottom barges, right? When you, when you employ a flat bottom barge, what it, uh, what it provides you is... Uh, you need to understand what you're uh, hiring and what you're using. So the flat bottom barges have two anchor patterns. Uh, you need two anchor patterns because why? The uh, heavy lifting crane is on the port side. It's in the middle of the rig. So what we need to do is we need to first arrive in location, stand off 100 meters, pull ourselves into location and using the crane uh, lift the heavy lift, the derricks and everything, all the equipment onto the platform. Once we are done with heavy lifting, we will shift back over and do the drilling operations uh, mode. So as you can see, uh, we have double anchor patterns for lifting. There's a lower weather environmental tolerance. So this is uh, ideal for places like Malaysia, for uh, Gulf of Thailand, um, and for economical costs uh, for operations. Its wires are 1,400 meters long and uh, 
we we generally run our own anchor wires and all that with the anchor handling vessels. So let's go and see what's the difference between this and a semi sub. A semi sub can uh, offer the clients a single anchor pattern for lifting, which means when we arrive in field, we just run anchors one time, pull ourselves in forward, and we can uh, uh, we are using the crane that's on the port bow. Bow means the forward side of the rig. We will do the heavy lifting onto the platform, and once we are done with that, we pull ourselves backwards a bit and we are in drilling position already. How this differs is that these, oh, uh, back, back to the previous slide. How this differs is that this um, semi subs can work on the higher sea states, uh, longer swells, uh, you know, deeper waters, a wider range of operating drafts, uh, because uh, as we were saying, nine meters to 15 meters, we're able to do helideck lifts uh, off the old jacket platforms. And then uh, we can even do uh, unconventional lifts like uh, fitting of uh, flares and uh, other accessories that you need to install on the platform. So in that sense, we provide a more uh, uh, rounded and robust uh, drilling equipment, lifting operations type of uh, 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 tender for marketing. All right, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so they, there can be various applications of uh, these type of drilling rigs. Uh, so what we say is, uh, if we, what type of water depth can we work in? So we can work from anywhere from 50 meters to 150 meters on our own anchor wires. There's no issues. But what if it was uh, 500 meters? What if it was 1,000 meters? Can we still work there? Yes, we can still work there. Uh, what we will do is we will connect ourselves to pre-late moorings. And sometimes, uh, as, as the people in this uh, study group, you already know there are many, many types of platforms. There are TLPs, there are spas and all that. So how do we connect to these platforms? Uh, when we come into field, we will run the first few anchors uh, using anchor handling vessels to connect to the pre late moorings. And then we would uh, connect ourselves to the platforms using various uh, modifications or uh, engineered solutions. Like what you see here is the uh, Alliance and West Sino. Uh, 1, 2, 7, and 8 are connected to the TLP. 3, 4, 5, 6 are connected to the ground through pre late moorings. Uh, column extensions were added to the underwater sheaves to provide coupling to the TLP. So what this allows us to do is when you have a TLP, when you have a rig like us, we can move the whole TLP together with us using our moorings to find the well slots as we drill. Okay, let's take a look at the next picture. Oh, this is a spa. The Satya was sent to work with Kike Spa. Uh, we ran four anchors and then the other wires were uh, led through uh, the forward sheaves. Uh, we, we installed uh, sheaves to deflect the wire and lead it towards the spa so that we can hold ourselves together with the spa and move the spa as we do drilling operations and support operations. Okay, let's take a look at the next one. Okay, this is again another TLP in Africa. The Esperanza went to Africa in 2014, uh, worked for I think good three, four years there, supporting this uh, platform uh, called Okume. Uh, Again, it's one of those where you can see there's a various connective, uh, various bridal type of connective uh, between us and the platform. Okay, those are specially designed for these uh, special uh, platforms. Okay, next. This is uh, Malaysia's Malikai. So the Esperanza was on Malikai in uh, 2015, and recently we just finished with uh, Malikai in 2021. So Malikai is a very special rig uh, built for Malaysia, deep water, and, uh, and how this differs with most other uh, platform, uh, what we call TLP platforms is when we run our eight pre-laid moorings together, we are still connected to the uh, TLP by search horses and cross horses. These search horses and cross horses allow us to move the whole TLP itself along with two uh, fallback lines on the opposite side of the tender, uh, opposite side of the platform. And we can locate using a mismatch system, which is uh, sort of like eyes in the water. So we will be able to locate the holes or the wells, well slots as we do the drilling. So all the gray color part that you see on top of the yellow color, the yellow color is Malikai. The gray color belongs to us, which is our drilling package. So we, we provide the hardware, we provide the drilling mud, we provide the people, the expertise uh, and all that in order to do the drilling operations. So... Uh, when you see a project like Malikai, at the end of the day, we are also there to install all the moorings and uh, connect up the two rigs and the TLP side. All right, so let's go to the next uh, 
outlets. So the next question is, how do we get our rigs into location? What, what do you need to get the rigs into location? So for me, I have a very good uh, rule of thumb. Uh, for any tow duration under 14 days, tow duration under 14 days, I would use a wet tow method. A wet tow method, as you can see in the first picture, right, is the rig being towed by a tow boat. Okay, when the rig is being towed by a tow boat, we call it a wet tow. And the bottom of the picture, you can see the uh, rig is riding, a, 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 what do you call it, a HLV vessel. It itself is a semi-sub vessel. So that is a, um, we call it dry tow. Anything above 14 days, I call it a dry tow. So for wet tows, we would still be manned up as per normal. We will have 60, 70 crew, enough for one lifeboat capacity. The drill crews will be there. The marine crews will be there. But the third-party crews all will sign them off. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see you in the next platform when you are hired on the other side. But when we go into wet tow mode, we get towed. Uh, so everything from food, catering, uh, drilling, everything is still us. We are still in charge. But when you are talking about more than 14 days of tow, we're talking about maybe 5,000 5, uh, nautical miles. When you're talking about 5,000 nautical miles uh, and towing at three and a half to four, four knots, right? We're yeah. talking about if we are wet towing, it would take nearly three months, four months to get there. You know, we will run out of food, run out of fuel. We will have to stop a couple of times. It will be uneconomical, uh, not safe uh, for the crew. It would stress out the um, towing gear. So in order to reduce all these style of uh, cost, and safety exposures, uh, you know, critical security exposures to the rig. What we'll do is we'll send them onto a HLV vessel. Now, the top picture you can take a look. Um, the HLV vessel is already ballasted down. Oh, uh, uh, back to the previous picture. Uh, ballasted down, and when when they are ballasted down, we will take about four vessels to pull the vessel, uh, the rig onto it. We will show you a video later on to, to further explain this process. Okay, next picture, please. Okay, so wet tow method. Wet tow method is a conventional method to deliver the rig out. If we are coming out from port, uh, we would take four, 5,000 uh, BHP vessels. Uh, and uh, once we reach open waters or, or reach the pilot station, we would get the lead tow boat connected. Once the lead tow boat is connected to the tow bridle, we would stream out about maybe 300, 400 meters of tow wire and tow into location. So, like we said, anything below 14 days, wet tow is an economical and safe way to do it. We would have enough men, we will have enough water, we have enough medic uh, you know, coverage, we will have helicopter, medivac, uh, everything is available, we will do it the wet tow way. Uh, so, for wet tows, uh, for our, uh, sorry, previous picture, 120-ton uh, bolat pool vessel for our semi-subs, and then for 100 tonne bolat pool for our uh, flat bottom tenders. That's the general rule of thumb we go by. Um, for those of you in the marine and nautical science, the reason being tow curve. When you have a tow curve, you know that you're towing at three to four knots. You know that uh, there are, what is the tension that you require? What is the bolat pool that you require? So you're using up to maybe about 40 to 60 tonne, but as you know, bolat pool tests are flat calm water, but you are going through uh, environs. With that, we need to make sure that you have enough uh, excess power or enough redundancy power to be able to tow and reach your port safely. Uh, okay, next. Okay, so uh, we would like to share with you guys a video that we made uh, for the Sapura Brani that was uh, delivered to Africa. Uh, it was floated off in Labuan. Uh, we are going to share a video with you guys. Yep, I will be sharing my screen in a few seconds.
That was great. Wow. Okay. So just a fun trivia, Harry. Um, you and myself, we were there um, uh, during the operations. I was controlling the drone footage right on top of the helidag. And then I remember um, Nazirul as well, who I see in the chat, is actually involved in the operations as well. That was a really hectic operations. I think we had like, you know, uh, really, really short sleep during those periods. Okay, that was an interesting one. Uh, we have our own in-house rig movers. So I myself, I was on one of the lead uh, anchor hand uh, what pilot and anchor handling vessels. So I had Benson, my other rig mover, on another one of the vessels. I had the kit, the rig mover, also on the Sapura Brani. Now, this was one of those challenging operations where we have to uh, depart on time, uh, de-anchor on time, and then get ourselves into location and, uh, you know, Barring uh, everything goes well, we will put our rig onto the HLV. And once that is done, they need enough time to ballast up safely. And once they're done, uh, we will demob all the crew from there and leave uh, one or two if we have to. We will leave about one or two crew. But then this being a COVID, COVID type of uh, scenario, we would need to uh, unman everyone, uh, get the rig shut down and then safely bring it there. So uh, how does a rig move differ uh, in, in this COVID era, in this COVID age. I'm going to share with you uh, some of the impacts that we, and challenges that we have. We've had to do some very, very, uh, how say, untried methods in this uh, safe but untried methods, uh, risk engineered out methods. Uh, so as you can see, this is one of the, uh, one of the rig moves that I did uh, recently uh, during this COVID period. It is um, a very challenging time because why? One, entry into countries are restricted. Leaving your country is restricted. Um, in order to leave Malaysia, you have to have one, uh, either work outside, employer outside. Two, you have to have permanent residency or uh, what do you call that? They, they say you must have long-term pass outside. Three, you must sacrifice your right to be a Malaysian to come back. You must say that I waive the right to be treated. I willingly accept the risk on the other side. That's what we had to sign in the airport in order to go out for the first, uh, during the first MCO. Second, when we arrive, before we even leave the country, we already swap. You need to get a COVID swap uh, up your nose and then uh, you get your, uh, once you get your results, you go to the airport, you have a slew of uh, paperwork in order to submit into the police, uh, the, the, to, the, to the, what do you call it? To the ticketing people before they even allow you to leave. Once you leave, the immigration takes a look at you and say, okay, you come sign this form. You tak boleh balik sampai MCO habis ya. That was the, that was the sentence they told us. You know, at that time, there was no, no clear SOP yet. Everyone was just scared. So that's quarantine period. Three, unable to mix bubbles of safety. Once you arrive at a location, everyone considers you a bubble. You are a bubble, you're a bubble. Why? The vessel itself is a bubble. The country itself is a bubble. The, the ship itself is a bubble. So, you, you're not allowed to mix anymore. It's not like uh, normal. So this is one of the uh, rig moves that I did. Uh, I brought a rig to Indonesia. Upon uh, coming to Singapore, I had to quarantine 14 days. Okay, going out from the project, I, I entered the rig. I had to sign on and then go out, do the rig move, come back. And then an entry into Singapore, quarantine another 14 days. After you leave Singapore, you get back to Malaysia, you quarantine another 14 days. In between every 14 days is two COVID swaps. You know, one on your entry, one on your exit, you know, to make sure that you are safe. So, it's a lot of swap, swap, swap in order to get that done. Uh, another one of those operations that we've done is, uh, we needed, we've, this is, this is uh, when we had a vessel that was, uh, one of our rigs was doing SPS, Special Periodical Survey in Singapore. But we had to deliver this rig back to its clients uh, during COVID period. So they say, oh, you cannot sign people on in Singapore. We won't accept anybody to come in. Oh, one, your crew is restricted now. You can't get people in and out of Singapore. You can't get other people to come in and man up their own rigs. So what do we need to do? I, did, I had to do something called, uh, we created a departure team, a crack team, and a joining team. Uh, this is one of those challenges that we had to do. We had to do an unmanned tow to, uh, what do you call it? Unmanned to uh, Brunei. Okay, next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is one of those uh, very, very special rig moves. Uh, whenever you do a rig move during a, a COVID period, you go there, you, are, you have to mask up. You don't know what they have. You don't know what you have. They don't know what you have. And uh, at times, when, even when you move a rig and the rig is empty, they would still go and, uh, uh, what do you call that? Fumigate the lead tow vessel, fumigate the rig, fumigate everything. And then on return, you are put into this special quarantine. Oh no, you cannot come in. You know, stand by. Yeah, stand aside, sir. Don't move. Uh, we will come and address you. In Singapore, right, in order to get on and off the rig, they would have to take picture of you entering the boat. They had to <laughs> take picture of you entering the taxi. They had to take picture of you entering the hotel, entering the room, and to send your picture back into the government. That's how strict uh, some countries are. Okay, let's go to the next uh, slide. This is one of those. Uh, this is one of the crack team uh, operations that I'm talking about. When they share this slide with you, please click on this link. This link will bring you to the story. Uh, we will not click on the story here. This is uh, just a brief on this story. Uh, what we did was, in order to depart from Singapore, I had to do a operations. I had to do a remote operations uh, in a sense that I have people who have never seen my rig before, but they have marine experience. I have people who have driven cranes before but have never done my operations. So what we had to do is we had to write out very, very detailed operations, very, very detailed procedures and explain to them, okay, I need you to do this, I need you to do this, I need you to do this. Show me the camera. Is this? Yes, yes, do it this way, do it this way, you know. We had to explain to them remotely. So at Singapore, I manned it up with a departure crew. Enough people to just start the rig, stop the rig, uh, send the uh, lead tow bridle across. I, I, oh, this was one of those special times. Uh, Singapore's shipyard and Singapore's uh, industries had this thing called the uh, dormitory cluster. Uh, dormitory cluster was when all the shipyards were shut down because everyone got COVID, everyone caught COVID. Yep. So we had to man up with people who were safe from harbour tug companies. So the harbour tug companies send their crew, their bosuns, their, you know, the people all up there to unmoor the rig, bring it out, tie up the, what do you call it? The, the harbour tugs, bring it out. And then uh, I had to have my special people, the, what do you call departure team. I go through my processes and say, okay, you're going to hand over the tow bridle to the lead tow boat. Then you're going to shut down the rig. Then you're going to have to check, make sure that the cranes are bolted down. Make sure that everything is see fast enough. Make sure your emergency tow wire, everything is done. Then get off the rig. So at Singapore Pilot Station, we had to get everybody off. Had to have the tow vessel do it with, uh, what do you call We had to have ABS as well, ABS involved. We had to have single tow unmanned voyage survey. We had to have a single tow with the, uh, what do you call approval from the marine mm -hmm. warranty survey. Everything was different from what we are used to now. So the rig sailed off into the sunlight, uh, into the sunset with the no crew on board. So we, we got this uh, rig to come into Labuan Waters. In Labuan Waters, what we did was uh, I got one of my rig movers to go on and come in with a tuck team from Labuan. So this was a crack team. The crack team's uh, task from Labuan was to approach the rig as it is still moving and hurtling into Labuan waters with no brakes. So what we need to do is we need to come alongside the pontoons, get my rig crew and my, what do you call it? Get my rig mover and the uh, tuck crew to go to the back pontoon, throw on the rope to stop the rig, hold it in position. Then we contact the boarding team, the joining team from uh, Brunei. The joining team from Brunei came in from Brunei waters, came up, manned up the rigs, and then we sent it along until she got into location. So these were all untried, untested, un, what do you call it? unmanned uh, processes that we had to do uh, on COVID. Because why? We have to deliver. We, we promised our clients we would deliver the rig there to do their operations. We had to deliver it on time. Otherwise, their drilling program would not run. So this is, these are some of the challenges that we had to do and we had to get done. Okay, let's go yep. to the next slide. So um, again, uh, if you want to have a look at this, we hope to send you guys the um, overall PDF presentation of this right after the session. Uh, the next slide should be on the second theme. So thanks again, Captain Harry, for the first part of the introduction to drilling rigs. Um, obviously, I, I hope it helped a lot of you guys to see the, uh, the challenges and the impact that COVID-19 has created, uh, especially with regards to the rig move. But what we can take out of this is that it's, it's, it's manageable. 
Um, and um, again, you know, with, with, with Captain Harry's uh, uh, experience, we, we, we managed to do a few projects that was uh, able to overcome the COVID challenges. Anyways, um, let's talk about the second part of our uh, session, which is the general life on board, on board and all rig. I think this is the, the highly anticipated uh, session with everyone because um, it involves more towards the, uh, the, the, the rig crew's uh, perspective of what life is like and it will give you a, a, a first-hand view of what life is like actually on board. So we're going to talk about basically the organization chart of um, of uh, what life is like on board a rig, uh, the roles and responsibilities. Uh, we will also show a video of a walkthrough um, of a day in the life on board a uh, drilling rig. Um, the video will showcase some of the modes of transportation to go to a drilling rig. Um, there are also some footage of facilities that you will like to see uh, on board a drilling rig. And most importantly is the office hours, you know, like how long do you have to stay offshore? And uh, we will also talk about how COVID-19 impact the uh, office hours. So this slide, all right, uh, Peter, it's all up to you now. Uh, I think you're on mute. Yep. <laughs> Sorry again. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, what do you see the uh, drilling uh, organization chart, right? This is what we get for the campaign. As as you all know, you know, the manning is it's it's being paid by the client. So the more they pay, the more people they can have on board, right? Obviously, the more people we have, uh, it's good for us. But uh, unfortunately, this is the minimum manning that we have on board. Uh, as you can see, for a tender rig. Uh, a semi-tender, it can occupy about 160 POV. Uh, for a tender, it can occupy about 145 POV on board. So as you can see on the top section over there, uh, on your left-hand side, this is where we have the onshore. I think uh, Peter is uh, having connectivity issues, right, from the rig. Is it, can I confirm, Harry? Okay, uh, okay, Peter is back, Peter is back, okay. Peter, you were stuck just can you, to... Uh, sorry, can you hear me? You. Yes, now I can we, hear you now. Okay, okay. Yep. Okay, going back, going back to the organization chat. Uh, on the uh, onshore side, you can see that we have the uh, support from the... So we have the IT supports and then we also have the HAC department which support us together with the marine tech support. We have the HR... Uh, training and development, and lastly, the uh, supply chain. Basically, we have the buyers and so on. And uh, the rig, uh, we wholly depend on the uh, rig manager. He will be our first contact uh, point if uh, anything happens over here, uh, whether it's good or bad. He's the key person. Uh, for the client side, you'll have the uh, company drilling soap. So they are the person who are basically on the offshore supporting us on the, uh, sorry, on onshore supporting us on the offshore. And then, uh, Below that, we have our OIM. Basically, he's the offshore installation manager. He's the head of our uh, department over here. And for the client side, we have uh, the company representative. Uh, basically, we call them as a DSP, uh, drilling superintendent, right? So for under their branch, uh, normally we'll have a DSV on board, a night DSV on board, and then we'll, you also have a well site operational engineers. And uh, you'll have a uh, client safety reps on board. And uh, normally during completion, we'll have the uh, completion supervisor on board. And also it will be supported by the uh, materials coordinator. So that comes from the client side. For us, uh, if you look at the branch below, uh, for the drilling, uh, basically we have a tower pusher who will be on days and night. And then we have a driller one day on night. And we have an AD. Same again, one day, one night. And then below that, we'll have a senior permit, uh, one day, on night. And then junior permit, same one day, one night. And then Derek man, followed by the uh, floor man. Uh, normally for the operation, uh, we'll have five or four floor men, depending uh, how the bridging document is does. And then uh, moving on to the uh, marine department, we have the uh, barge engineer. Uh, under him will be uh, assistant barge engineers. Uh, ballast control operators, heavy lift crane operators, tender crane operators, head roster boards, and then below him will be four roster boards uh, on the tender side and uh, 
we also have the seamen or the painters, right? Uh, for the maintenance crew, uh, there's a two division there. One is for the uh, senior mechanics, uh, and then uh, under him will be the mechanics and assistant uh, mechanics. And under him, there'll be a motorman. Basically, he's the one who will be watching the engine room, right? So uh, for the electrical department, uh, we'll have the senior electrician. Under him, will be an uh, uh, electrician. Uh, basically, he'll be on night and the senior electrician will be on days. And he'll, uh, during the days, he'll have an assistant electrician. And then there goes me, safety officer. Under me will be the uh, medic and also the uh, radio operator. And then we have the... Uh, uh, supply chain, whereby we have the materials man, stock keeper, and also we'll have a welder. And on the catering side, basically the head of the catering will be the cam boss. Under him, there'll be cooks and also the utility hands. So as you can see on the far right, we also have uh, third-party service companies. So basically, these are the guys. We have the mud engineers, cementers, uh, mud loggers, data engineers, DDs, casing crew. Uh, cutting dryers or wire liners, upper completion, lower completion, uh, fisherman if we need it, and scaffolders and also the hookup crew. So these are the team that we we'll always have on board depending on the scope of operation we have. Yep. Just to and add on that, uh, sorry, yep. uh, just to add on that, like the main three uh, tridents that we need to look into is the drilling contractors, uh, the company man from the oil operators and the third party subject matter experts. So usually this is the three tridents that uh, organize the uh, drilling campaign. Yeah. Right. Um, now let's move on to the next slide. This is the office hours, right, Peter? Yeah. So what you guys are seeing now, that's it's, it's basically uh, working hours, how it used to be before COVID, right? So this is how the working hours work, you know. The normal shift hours, it's uh, 12 hours on tour, and the guys get 12 hours on rest. If it has to be extended, it can go to, from 14 to 16 hours. And uh, depending on that uh, maximum of that we do, we need to have minimum eight to 10 hours as our rest period, right? It, it won't go beyond 16 hours, but if it does, it has to have a uh, special permission from the rig manager and also from the client reps, right? How about our hitch days? It's uh, the golden days, right? So normal hitch, 28 days, uh, Rest period for local is 14 days, for experts is 28 days. And the maximum hitch they can do uh, before this COVID was 35 days, right, for the drilling crew. And uh, the rest period for the after the maximum hitch was 14 days minimum. You have to be home before you head back to the rig. I think there's one point, uh, there was a driller who wants to extend uh, more than 35 days and... Uh, uh, it's, it's still fresh in my mind. The DSV says, no, 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 you can't do that, right? So that was before COVID, <laughs> yeah? yeah? So how does the uh, working hours uh, for the crew, uh, the shift for the HODs normally is between uh, 0 to 600 to 1800 hours and the night shift will do 1800 hours to the 0 600 hours. The drilling and the marine crew, they'll be doing uh, 12 to 12, uh, 12 to 100 hours to uh, midnight and then midnight to uh, midday, right? The maintenance crew, normally they'll be like uh, uh, in the morning shift, six, 0, 0600 hours to 1800 hours and 1800 hours to 0, 0600 hours. This including the seamen. The catering crew, they normally work 7 to 7, right? Day and night. And then the service partners, uh, normally they have a shift, uh, 0, 0600 to 1800 hours uh, or 1800 hours to 0, 0600, but depending on the operation, they'll be always on standby. So we can't uh, predict their, how about their working hours, but uh, the maximum working hours still goes to 12 working hours. And the most important part out of this is that all this shift is to cover a 24-7 uh, hour operation, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, correct. Cool. Thank you so much. So next slide. 
All right, so guys, we will be going through a walk around uh, on a day in the life of going on board a rig. So there are two videos I'll be showing with you, uh, with you guys. Uh, the first is just a preview of the offshore life. This will be more of a corporate video for everyone to have a look in in terms of the roles and responsibilities. Uh, the second video will be the personal footage of a rig crew currently on board Esperanza. Um, so in the meantime, while I'm sharing, uh, Peter, can you just walk us through, you know, the your idea in bringing out this personal footage uh, from the rig crew? Oh, okay. So, when you, when you guys see the uh, personal footage of the rig crew, right? So, basically, uh, what I've done is that, uh, you know, it's not being scripted. You know, we just walk into the uh, working area and we try to get uh, as much as as much info we can because we, we like to show the real experience what we are facing on the offshore. Yep. And I will be sharing my screen in a few seconds. All right, and jump.
All right, so that was the first video. Now we'll be sharing the um, rig footage from um, the interview sessions that uh, Peter has worked on. So just bear with me for a few seconds. Okay, this is, will be a bit more of a personal touch uh, rather than a uh, corporate type of video. So enjoy everybody. Hi, okay, now uh, kita akan masuk dalam freezer. Eh? This is our freezer. Alright. Ini adalah cara kita simpan kita punya stok makanan. Okay. So, barang ini bila sampai, uh, Jabri? Uh, dua hari yang lalu. Dua hari yang lalu. Uh, biasa dalam uh, satu bulan berapa kali kita akan dapat stok makanan? Eh? Satu bulan, dua kali atau tiga kali. Dua kali atau tiga kali. So, boleh tak kamu tunjuk kepada rakan-rakan kita ni uh, Kita punya dry stock Boleh, boleh, jom, okay. jom, jom jom. Alright. jom kita tengok kita punya stock Ah Ini kita punya stock, dry stock okay. Kita ada macam-macam sini Kita ada cereal, kita ada baking item okay. Kita ada sauce, sauce kebiti so yang penting kita ada tes bila kita sip ya then bila lebih hydrated so kita tip for system tip for system ah tip for system buat buat ah first thing for ah okey apa kamu ada kat sini right kita ada lot of hops kita ada fun kita ada juice okey okey alright yang rack terakhir pula rack terakhir kita ada noodle dry noodle Hey guys, it's me again, uh, Mr. DSTO. Now I'm meeting the uh, uh, floor mans and also we have uh, Uncle Ghana who is the driller. Okay, I'm going to throw them a few questions and then we see how the answer. Okay, uh, apa khabar semua? Okay, sudah berapa lama on board? Sudah 6 minggu sekarang. Huh? Okay, yang pertama ni, Abang Kalau. Sudah berapa lama kerja offshore? Start dari media anda, start dari mana? Start daripada 2000. Ha. So mula-mula masuk offshore ni kerja sebagai apa? Uh, Mantenan dekat platform. Mantenan dekat platform? Ya. Okey. Uh, sekarang apa kerja sebagai apa? Sebagai floorman. Sebagai floorman. Sudah lama kerja sebagai floorman? Floorman staff 2006 sampai sekarang. Okey. Terima kasih bang. Okey. Next one. Stanley. Ya. Yeah. Okey. Stanley tu kerja sebagai apa? Uh, floorman. Floorman. Uh, Stanley ni actually lead roughneck lah. Ya. Yeah. Okey. Apa tanggung jawab kamu sebagai lead roughneck ni? Jaga, jaga sedikit kan kru Okay, alright So, berapa tahun Stanley sudah kerja offshore? Uh, 14 tahun 14 tahun Okay, sekarang sudah lebih 6 minggu lah yeah. Okay, apa perasaan kamu ni uh, Bila berada jauh daripada keluarga ni? Okay, sedih Minggu Ya yeah. Macam lah Okay Stress eh. Okay guys, uh, what you see now We actually in the maintenance boat now So I can't show you much but uh, this is what we call uh, the driller's cabin. Uh, this is where we control everything. So let us go in and uh, talk to Uncle Ghana about uh, the functions in the driller's cabin. All right. Okay, Uncle Ghana. Uh, just tell us a uh, piece and piece about the driller's cabin over here. The driller's cabin in the Better than any other is the first time I say we got aircon, you know, some other days we don't have this kind of a cabin, you know, it's open, okay, okay, very good system, very set up, 
very nice, you know. It is not in operation otherwise I can show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just tell us uh, what are these all about? Yeah, this is a uh, joystick. Huh? This is what we pick up the block and the. Okay. The next and one. This is, uh, this is all pumps. Okay. Uh, four pumps. We can operate pumps. Huh? And this is all for the top drive. Huh? Top drive to make connections, link here, you know, and uh, rotate the. Uh, I mean the top drive. Okay. What what you see here? This is main indicator. Okay. Main indicator. This is shows like how much we pulling, how much going down. So this will be Patrick's uh, cabin as I go inside. Hey, hello, saya habis sura his brother. Boleh cakap sikit pasal uh, controller joystick ni semua ke? Boleh. Ah uh, ini kita punya control joystick. Ah uh, ini pakai macam mouse uh, up down. Ah uh, sebelah, sebelah kanan, sebelah kiri kita kita pakai uh, boom turun, boom naik. Swing kan, uh, kiri, swing kanan, buat plak kiri. Okay. Okay. Apa pula yang tu bang? Untuk yang tu tu bang. Ini untuk wet dari kita kita uh, dalam pecahan. Untuk kita tahu wet berapa wet kita angkat. Yang kita ini besar sedikit ada dua wet dari kita. Satu untuk blok kecil, satu untuk blok besar. Okay. Yang itu pula, yang bagian atas tu. Yang ini, yang gas tu. Yang gas ini kita tahu pressure berapa tu berapa kita pakai macam kita uh, ini low pakai boom up, boom down dia. Ini slow, kita swing, berapa pressure Berapa swing, kita pakai pressure Ini dia boss, up and down Kita tahu berapa pressure, kita up and down juga Okey. Apa kegunaan monitor ni bang? Monitor ini, uh, kegunaan ni sebenarnya untuk kita uh, Barang yang kita akan nampak Jadi kita nampak orang kerja dekat bawah sana Yang blind lift Ini yang penting, kamera ini untuk pakai kita blind lift Okey. Untuk se lifting yang kita buat ni uh, Bagaimana komunikasi? Apa abang rasa pasal komunikasi? Ya, terima kasih kalau... Okey, Pak. Apa abang punya nasihat kepada budak-budak baru kita yang nak datang kerja offshore ni? Ya, kita kasih dia training. Bagus-bagus. Uh, training dia bagus-bagus. Macam saya juga, saya pun training. Saya pun dari bawah juga. Uh, bagi dia orang, uh, motivasi kerja. Seti mesti menjaga keutamaan. Okey. Itu yang paling penting. Oh, sekarang, uh, time COVID ni apa abang rasa? Pasal uh, time COVID ni abang perlu berada dekat kuarantin kan? Lepas tu datang sini tidak boleh balik. So, apa apa punya perasaan? Saya punya perasaan uh, apa boleh buat kita kita sokon ini kita punya company dengan pasal kerja pasal uh, kita harus terlambat sama ini company kalau kita tidak sokon macam mana? Dan pasalah kita kumpulkan dengan diri pasal kita sudah lama sama ini company. Okay. Alright, pak terima kasih. Alright, uh, now I'm at the uh, Sakurai Brothers uh, warehouse, right? So you want to see how our uh, big warehouse looks like? Doing. <laughs> hey, that's our storeman, uh, Henley Jana, right? So that's Henley. Okay, let me have a few words with Henley because he will be our tour guide. Hello, Henley. Yeah. All right. Mau minta tolong sikit? Okey, kita mau buat satu virtual untuk kita punya kawan-kawan uh, dekat uh, tahu. So, boleh tak you walk around and tunjuk kita apa yang barang yang kita ada dekat warehouse ni? Barang kita ada? Ya. Yeah. Okey, kita mana barang. Tapi, cakap sebenarnya, cakap sekejap apa perception yang kita ada. Alright. <coughs> Okey, apa yang benda yellow color ni? Apa ni? Ini... Flammable cabinet. Flammable cabinet, okey. So, apa yang kita simpan dalam flammable cabinet? Ini spray can. Okay. Ah, okay. Alright, so. Okay, next. Uh, apa yang kita ada dalam rat ni? Fitting. Semua fitting? Fitting. 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 So, ni adalah Nicholas. Hi Nicholas. Okay, so dia akan bawa kita tunjuk kita bahagian uh, mechanical department. Okay. Okay, mula-mula. Okay, ni adalah kita punya maintenance office di mana uh, Arnold, kita punya chief mechanic. Yeah. Hi Arnold. Okay, everything okay? Okay, and now... Right, ini adalah kita punya workshop, okay. So, uh, you nampak kan lah dia ada pakai 
cap ah actually the cap is the uh, bump cap so it's allowed to wear inside the engine Jenis-jenis chemical dia? Mobilian mark, water based mark dan brine Dan brine Okay, so boleh tak semua orang masuk dalam pit room sini? Tak boleh lah Kenapa you rasa tak boleh lah? Kena minta itu rice Alright guys, what you see now is actually uh, how the guys actually use the safety harness And then they clip to the sleeve And then they climb all the way up to the uh, one of the top mask section Get up heights, then you don't belong here. Why did they you turn here? That's why they ask you to turn here. Uh, Zaha, you're on mute. Zaha. Zaha, you're on mute. Uh, wow. Guys, that was a really great video actually. Um, thanks a lot, Peter, again for your dedication. You know, um, I, I'm actually... I, I've seen... I think I worked with at least half of the people I've seen in that video. I hope they're doing well. Are they all doing okay right now? <laughs> <laughs> but really, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for the effort. It, it, it's uh, really good. Um, so yeah, guys, that was... Uh, um, again, I just wanted to say to everyone here uh, to make sure, you know, um, to our international viewers or who's not a, a, a Malay-speaking background, uh, we will try to um, post this up on YouTube uh, for you guys uh, to see. But we, we unfortunately, we just want to apologize that you don't have the translation uh, in English. So yeah, um, that showcased a lot of the personal aspects on our uh, drilling rig. Uh, let me just share my screen again. Alright, so now we are uh, basically went through the uh, second part of the video, which was the uh, general life on board of a drilling rig. Now we are going to go into the safety uh, on an oil rig. So it is um, it's a really important question to us. Uh, it's also a, a one of the most popular ones as well. Um, so there's a stigma actually among the uh, among the industry where people say that you know it's 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 not really safe. So that's why there's a lot of questions of what people being scared of going offshore. I think a lot of pop culture reference with Deepwater Horizon, the movie as well, put into a, a different kind of uh, a view of life offshore. Uh, so maybe Peter can go over later in through this uh, part to um, to go on the uh, actual common safety hazard uh, on an oil rig. Um, we also want to talk about you know women representatives offshore. We 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 are aware that uh, there was a lack of diversity, but maybe Peter can also tell us you know it's it's not the case right now. Um, and obviously you know the, the question a lot of uh, our women viewers were asking was is it safe to for women to work offshore? So this is applicable for for everyone. You know, is it really safe? Um, and lastly the. Deep Water Horizon, um, there was a follow-up from last week's session. There was somebody asking about Deep Water Horizon. We will try to touch base about Deep Water Horizon a little bit. 
uh, it's it's mainly um, more on what we want to talk about the safety standards that has changed uh, with regards to the drilling rig industry. We won't be really talk talking about the we won't really talk about the water horizon in itself. So, all right. Um, I will pass on back to Peter to go over the uh, safety on board a drilling rig. Go ahead, Peter. All right. Uh, thank you, Zaha, again. Uh, welcome, guys, again. Uh, all right. Uh, as you can see from the picture itself, uh, drop is being the uh, one of the biggest uh, hazards for our industry. Uh, also, we have like a hands and finger injury, another concern that uh, uh, we have to take care during uh, when we are working over here. So, as you can see, uh, the industry has its demand whereby a lots of uh, work activity that in north has a drop potential, right? So here we have a lot of liftings like uh, highland operation, crane lifting, uh, man riding operations, work being performed with tools uh, and height on the rig floor. And uh, we have activities like uh, making up a drill pipe connection, pulling out a hole, uh, landing a BHA, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, Especially on the rig floor, you can always see that the traveling block and the top drive uh, always on the constant move. Also on the crane, you know, tender to uh, on the tender, we always see the cranes being uh, move a lot, being used a lot. We always offload, backload, you know. So so there's there's a lot of activities which involve uh, lifting and the potential for for drops uh, kind of high there. So just to uh, for the new new guys over here, you know, we always classified drops as two. One is the static drop, the other one will be the a dynamic drop. So, so what does uh, static drop means? It means basically a solid object uh, initially at rest that falls from its original position under its own weight, right? The second one is going to be the dynamic drop object. Basically, it's a solid object that breaks free from uh, its fastening due to applied force. Uh, from the impact of some other equipment, probably okay. for example, like there's a two crane and it, it is it collide with something, then it falls. That goes as a dynamic drop object. Right? Safety, static drop object. Normally, what we do in the rig, we give example as Dorian. You know, if the Dorian falls by itself. That's static, right? So, uh, why does it happen, right? So we are exposed to the weather condition, right? So. Uh, and uh, this thing uh, lead to a dissimilar metals, you know, corroded stuff and uh, no proper housekeeping. So all these could lead to a, uh, to a drops potential uh, incident, right? And if you don't have a proper secondary retention from the equipment, that can be a drops potential drops. So how do we prevent that? So we try to eliminate people from being under the uh, load itself. So, so we divide to two. One is the uh, no-go zone. And the other one is the raid zone. So what does no-go zone mean? No-go zone means uh, where there's a high potential for drop objects. So this area will be controlled with a permit to work and physically marked off at all times with rigid or chain barriers, right? So example, including uh, a barricaded uh, area below the crane boom during maintenance or inspection, right? So if you go over there, you see the barrier, you need to respect the barrier. There's always an alternative route for you guys to use. So you can always use that, yeah. And the uh, second one with the red zone, where there is a medium potential draw object, uh, so a designated PIC will be assigned. Uh, he is accountable for permitting the personnel to enter the red zone. Uh, and the principal rule for entry into a red zone is to perform an authorized activity and to minimize exposure through exit immediately upon completion of duties. So, example, include drillers' permission and authorization required whenever you are up there on the rig floor. At the rig zone. So if you don't ask him, you can't enter the rig floor, right? And uh, lastly, will be the drops inspection. Uh, a monthly drops inspection and also a weekly drops inspection will be carried out uh, on uh, drop object uh, location, uh, which are presented. We have a checklist, so we need to follow the checklist uh, and uh, make sure we do the uh, checks uh, properly, right? As per the overall bricks uh, drops program that we have. So this uh, inspection area covers various sections of the derrick and the traveling equipment, uh, decks uh, substructure, uh, the tender cranes and other equipments at height. And uh, these inspections are carried out by the designated drops area inspector within the inspection report captured and tracked into a synergy. So we train them and then we make sure that they, they do the job properly. Right? That's that's on drop. I'd like to touch more, but I think we are limit time. So 
Yep. Uh, Zaha, we can uh, move to the next. Yep, one. definitely. Yep. So the next would be a question on how do you keep up with the safety standards every day, right? So I think this will be a good explanation on how we do that. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, safety on board a drilling rig. Uh, there's uh, there's a saying, right? There's always a lot of uh, safety on the walls, safety on the shelf, but bringing it to the people's head that's a, that's the biggest challenge that we have, right? Uh, so we have lots of programs on board, right? The first one, uh, what you can see from the picture will be the pre-towers and the GSM, right? Uh, right now, what, what you're seeing that. Uh, okay, during the uh, pre-tower uh, meetings, right? It's basically, sorry, Zaha? Yep, sorry, my bad. It's back to the pre-tower. Okay, okay. during the uh, pre-tower meeting, uh, prior to the commencement of every sh- Prior to commencement of every shift, there shall be a pre-tower meeting either uh, department-specific or as a collective group. So the meetings will cover as a pre-tower agenda. So normally what we'll highlight during this uh, pre-tower will be the highlight of the observation cards that we submit uh, almost every day. Lesson learned from the uh, event sharing, uh, basically we call it as a flash alert, and we'll cover operation, whatever happens uh, 12 hours before and what are we expecting to do in the next 12 hours, right? So we also will touch on the CIMO operation or any summary of our operational boundaries. And uh, for the GSM, uh, normally, you know, it's going to be uh, the whole uh, week uh, review, you know, we have a main topic. So for example, like we can pick on drops, we can pick on PP, we can pick on uh, whatever stuff. We also get the... Uh, uh, service hands to, to, to talk about their uh, job scope and what are the hazards that involve with their job scope so that we, we know what, what we are doing, right? And uh, following by that, we'll have the OIM's comments and also general discussion with the crew. So that goes for the GSM. Can you move to the next slide? Uh? Yeah. Okay, so for those who are, for those who are wondering, right, uh, you know, being a first timer on the rig, you know, how am I going to be out there, right? So we don't just throw you out there. You know, there's a there's a proper induction based on uh, for those who are uh, arriving to the rig. You know, we'll we'll cover we'll cover you know give you an induction handbook, which basically the induction will will cover you with a lot of stuff. You know, and uh, we also have a medical declaration form where we we ask details. A medic basically keeps the details of you. You know, if you're taking any prescription and so on. And we also will have a first day orientation, right? A checklist basically that the, the STO or the medic need to cover and show you around, get you familiarized uh, with the rig. Other than that, if you have your service hands uh, party, you know, we'll assign a mentor. So what does this mentor do? You know, his job is to basically to show you around uh, and, and he'll be the mentor until you familiarize with the whole rig, right? So until then, uh, you have to be... Uh, working in a shadow, right? Only then you can move on. So if you can see on the top section on the right side, we have uh, green, orange, and yellow hot hats, right? So the green basically tells you the person is being new to the rig. The orange tells you that he's being uh, recently promoted. And the white means he's a regular crew. So when you're, when you're over there, you know you know where you, do, who you need to meet, right? And basically below that, uh, we have our offshore house rules and also we... We show you where the master stations and uh, where our uh, live boats and uh, life saving uh, life rafts are. Can you move to the next slide? Thank you. Okay. Uh, what you are seeing now, these are the new uh, initiatives that they try to, and it's been a while, and I'm just presenting in a different way. Uh, the first one on the far left, that's your, that's your Bible, that's your, you know, life-saving rules. Whenever you're on a rig, you know, you need to make sure that you follow these 16 life-saving rules, right? Uh, different operators, they have their different uh, uh, numbers of life-saving rules, right? Like for PCSB, they have 10, for Shell, they have 12, but basically all these are combining and com- coming into as, as a one picture. So why we do have that? Because our industry uh, is a hazardous industry. Uh, we need to uh, strict uh, operational discipline, right? Uh, to ensure that we work safely. So the life-saving rules have been created uh, to keep our people safe. And the next one, it's a it's a prompt from us for as a line of fire. 
right? So what you can see that is that uh, right in the middle we have a energy wheel, right? So the, basically there's there's ten energy over there. So this is like a guide for you. You know, whenever you're out there, uh, whenever you're doing uh, prior to perform your job, you can relate all this ten energy and and relate to your work. Are, are we? Are we? What are the what are the hazard that involved with our operation and how we can mitigate them? So. The purpose of this document is to provide a simple tool that assists in ensuring potential line of fire hazard and risk identified and mitigated. That's that's basically that's R. Uh. And then uh, talking about hands-free working. So these guides help you how to prevent hand and finger injuries. That's that's the top five over there. Um, move to the next slide, brother. Yep. Uh, before I go on, uh, I know I understand it's already 10 p.m. We hope to continue uh, the session again uh, beyond 10. Maybe another extra 15 minutes if uh, everyone here don't mind. Um, it's been really informative so far. So yeah, go ahead, uh, Peter. Okay, sorry about that. So the next one oh, is yeah. the safe cargo. We have a, a proper guidance as for the industry best practice for safe cargo loading. And the next one will be the mental health. It's a guide to make sure that you're in good mental health. You know, we have the counseling set up, you know, for those who need it. This is basically you need to call the uh, online support that we have. And basically they can uh, guide you with your mental health. We also have medic uh, on board, then he can guide you also on that. And the last one, uh, basically, this is what we say, uh, a stock work authority. We have a full support from our management, uh, no matter who you are. The purpose of this policy is to ensure that uh, there's a clear understanding uh, by all employees that uh, in alignment with the stop work policy that each employee has a duty and also a responsibility to stop any work or act that they feel is unsafe and they can do it without any fear or recrimination. So we fully pledge and fully support on that. That's all. Uh, can move to the next one, sir. All right. Ah, interesting one. Okay. Is it safe for women to work? Uh, I can see uh, my previous colleagues, uh, Nabila is there. Probably she can tell much. I think we can ask her later on. So over the years, right, the, the oil and gas industry has started seeing more and more females coming to the work, right? So I feel that the working culture has been excellent over here. It's our desire to create a safe, personal, professional and harmonious working environment for everybody on board, right? So... If you're wondering whether we have female cabins on board, yes, we have. Privacy is really assured. And uh, as you can see from the picture itself, uh, we have a female drilling supervisor. That's uh, on the far right, uh, Magdalene. And then uh, you have uh, uh, well-site uh, engineers uh, on the other two. So on whether the females can be a rough neck or rough robot, that I'm not sure because it involves uh, greater physical uh, activities, right? Like... Uh, Climbing, hammering, pushing, pulling slips, and uh, we don't stop. We don't rain or shine. We have to work. So that's another thing that we need to consider on that. Uh, that's all for me, Zaha. Next, next slide. All right. Okay. Uh, this is Harry here. Um, so the question on the Macondo and Deepwater Horizon issues, right? Uh, what we decided to do was uh, to. Taking note of the time that we have left, uh, this would be a complete you know, lecture by itself or sharing by itself. So what we have done is uh, we've provided you guys a YouTube link. Uh, once they share out this one, right, uh, you will be able to uh, go into this link and it's uh, BP's findings on uh, what what uh, what the uh, how what are the safety standards that came out from this uh, incident. And uh, here are five of them, but uh, we'll not, we won't go really into them because that, that's going to take up a lot more time. But what we did is uh, we, we got you guys some homework so that you can look through the incident. And if you want the uh, more dramatized version, uh, what do you call it? entertainment version, the IMDB version is uh, Mark Wahlberg's uh, Deepwater Horizon. That one, you can bring your wives and your girlfriends there, show them how tough we work. You know, but you know, generally, the real issue is in this. All right, uh, we can go to the next slide. All right, so this will be the safety videos, right? Okay, so um, what we have done is uh, we have uh, created these safety videos to give you a flavor of uh, what are the hazards on a drilling rig, what are the hazards and how do you identify these hazards, what are the safety tools that you can uh, put in to engineer these, uh, what do you call the safety out. We hope you enjoy these videos uh, as we share them. All right, sharing it soon.
Well, enjoy.
Yeah, yeah, we found yeah. we find that entertaining. Uh, that was a what do you call it, a safety video we did for a uh, hazard identification uh, safety video that we did. Uh, I've been sharing that around. Some training centers use that as a training program for uh, introducing hazards to their uh, students, and uh, yeah, we hope you enjoyed that. Yep. Just to take out of that, even in the light-hearted uh, motion of the video, the most important is we always put safety as a top priority at the end of the day. All right. So next video will be the um, the heavy lift uh, operations, right? Okay. So um, we would like to just uh, bring a little bit of a flavor to you guys, uh, introduction to you guys. What are the dangers and what are the hazards that you can really face on the rig? Um, this is something that I did for a operations that we carried out in Africa. Uh, we hope you enjoyed. So that was a short and sweet uh, memory for us uh, for some challenges that we have uh, on uh, long swells. And uh, it's just to bring into perspective that the uh, direct equipment package itself is hundreds of tons. Um, the mass itself could be 300 tons. And uh, we're talking about things that are really, really huge. So everyone's got to put into practice all the safety tools uh, that we have in location. We will provide these uh, links for you guys. Uh, once they share the uh, yep. site packs. Yep. And also we hope to, you know, in the future sessions to have more of an insight of the heavy lifting activity, basically the rig up uh, footages and rig down footages, maybe in the future sessions, uh, depending on everyone's feedback from today. Anyways, um, okay guys, I know it's at 10.13. I believe we will extend again the timing of our uh, session. Uh, we hope you guys can bear with us and we just go through uh, the next part, which is the impact of COVID-19. This is a very, very important um, uh, part of the whole session. I think it puts everyone into perspective. So the first is the schedule during the pandemic. We will have a look at what the office hours is like after COVID. Um, how do you keep yourself sane when you are there for so long? Just a very... Um, short touch on what we do to keep our mental health up and running on the rig. Um, do rig personnel have to always wear a face mask? We can answer that question. Uh, swap tests, what are the precautions uh, taken, you know, before uh, we go on the rig or after we go on the rig? Uh, are workers required to be vaccinated, for example? Um, and also, um, the most important is what if there is a positive case, you know? Uh, so we will try to tackle all of these questions that was from the survey in this uh, next part. So Peter, I'll pass it back to you on the office hours after COVID. Okay, uh, thanks Zaha again. Uh, all right, uh, as for the working hours, right, it still remain the same, right, uh, for all of us. But the uh, big challenge or the big uh, changes that we had is uh, basically when you're covering your hitch, right? Uh, previously, it was 28 days. The maximum was 35 days. But... Uh, now it has become like uh, 42 days on board or some even go beyond that, right? So what do we do prior to mobilize to the rig? Uh, we had to undergo a strict quarantine uh, uh, at the PMSL, right? You are not able to go out. Uh, you have to stay in your room. So depending on your, uh, what do you call that? The view that you get, some gets car park, some gets uh, building, some gets golf courses. So that's what you see for the next 14 or 10 days, right? And while you're in the uh, quarantine center, you will get a swap twice. So depending on your result, if it's a good result, then you can uh, head back uh, to the offshore. So what happens is that uh, there's been many times where the back-to-back -back crew was unable to turn up due to the travel restriction. And some also has become a victim of COVID. So 
So how what we do here? So some has been exit for forty days on board, and then they have to go on shore, uh, reset their days, and then come back to work again because right? we are committed to the industry, right? So why we can't just hire another person to to replace us? So that's that's depend that uh, where you are working, right? Because like now, on our previous contract, we were in Sabah. So in order for you to work in Sabah, you need to have a work permit. So we can't just bring in people just like that. So he has to go undergo the training and so on, a medical. So with the MOCs and, and CMCO, so every place has been shut down. So it's 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 a difficult path uh, for us uh, down here. So uh, expats crew, right? So those who are staying uh, overseas, they were not able to travel back home. So there's some even cases stayed here just in Sabah uh, for ten months, right? So you can. Uh, go over so what we did was we did uh, promote uh, people within uh, when when we do that the man sometimes the many become lax uh, but the work has to be continued so there are a lot of challenges that uh, we need to address and uh, remain focused and uh, uh, work safely right at the end of the day what you want is to get the people uh, perform their safely no one gets injured that's our goal and uh, other than that, there was also a challenge with the uh, uh, logistic. Uh, basically, lots of parts, or you know, sometimes you are you, you need a part that basically can bring in, but you can't do that, you know. So the arrival of parts take time, so that could create a downtime to rigs and uh, delays the project. And also, when the guys leave the rig, they have to undergo another quarantine for two days and then you got to wait for your NX-14. Uh, once you get your NX-14, then you can fly out. So, but uh, for those, for example, like the crews was staying in Miri, even though they had been uh, on board and then they've gone undergone the quarantine, they did your swap test and then they got their result. But still, when they travel to Miri, they have to quarantine another 14 days. So, so there's, there's been a lot of challenges, man. There's a lot of uh, mental challenges. You know, you can't see your family members and so on. But uh, this is the industry that we picked. And uh, we have pledged uh, our commitment to the company. So as you can see from the interior itself, you know, we, we need to remain. And hopefully that uh, this pandemic can be over and uh, we can get back to normal. That's uh, from me, Zaha. Yep. So... Um, the, Yes, so that was the impact on the office hours. So basically, um, again, I'll send, share the next slide on a question that is very popular. So with all this impact towards the COVID-19 uh, procedures and, and having to be offshore a bit longer, I had experienced that last year when I was in Labuan. You guys are experiencing it right now. Um, how do you guys keep yourself sane on board? Uh, Peter, maybe you can go ahead first. Oof. Eat, sleep, work, playing games, watching <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I, I would uh, like to always uh, bring us into perspective that, um, you know, regardless of how, what challenges we face now, this is a very real uh, scenario that we are on. Uh, and we are all very, very lucky to be in, uh, what do you call that, uh, COVID situation in 2020. Now, can you imagine if this was 1993? And we are in COVID situation, or maybe exactly. 2003. Then all of us will be sitting yeah. in our cabins playing snake on our Nokia phones. <laughs> you know? So be, be, be positive minded, uh, be encouraged to uh, keep each other uh, liberty of it. Um, for those who are working uh, onshore, you know, there are also challenges. Um, people have now started working from homes. Uh, you know, people don't know how to separate home life from work life, uh, your bed is next to your computer table and stuff like that. But, you know, same thing on offshore. Um, people are facing these type of challenges. Uh, I've got right. uh, radio operators who are from Sarawak, but they are staying in uh, West Malaysia for nine months uh, because they can't afford to go back to their uh, home state. If they go in, they will be quarantined and they will miss their work cycle. So it's a challenging time for us. Uh, we, we do this for our livelihoods. We do this for the company. We keep everyone afloat. And the important thing is to keep ourselves safe and uh, make sure that we go home safe uh, and don't bring sickness back to our family. That's the most important thing. So when you ask us, is it worth it to stay quarantined? Is it worth it to go into, uh, is it worth it to get swapped? 
uh, it's all worth it because you want to keep the people who you love, who you're working for, safe when you go back home as well. Yep. It's, it's always important to have that mindset of going offshore. It's always to remember that you're going back home to see your families as well. Uh, I just wanted to touch base with a few photos here with everyone who's not familiar with the rig. Yes, uh, in some rigs, there's entertainment systems. Like you can see there's an arcade over here, football. Um, you know, these are sort of the facilities that some rigs may be able to provide. Me personally, I love going to the gym. And if you can see this picture, exercising on the heli deck, that's how I kept myself sane on board. I just wanted to emphasize the most important part is camaraderie, meaning that um, having a close friendship with, with the rig crew is really, really important. Um, and also, every Sundays, I always look forward to having uh, barbecues with, with the rig crew. I think you guys should be doing that on Esperanza, right? Every Sundays? Or not? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Good. That good. Thank God the tradition is going on. Um, so yeah, next slide will be also another tradition is that we never neglect any festive seasons. Um, who is this? Ah, uh, uh, Peter, is this on one of your rigs or? Uh, no, it's it's uh, Sapura T nine. Yeah, this was on Sapura T9. You can see that this is a very multiracial and, and very diverse uh, team over here. So that's, uh, what do you call that? Uh, this, I believe, is the Hari, Harigawai, right? Um, yes. yeah. We have a very, very talented group of uh, catering crew. Some yeah. of them, they put up so much effort to uh, make uh, you know, festivities home away from home for everyone. Uh, they really put their heart into it and we really would like to give a shout out to them. Uh, they, they do a really good job to keep the morale up on the rigs, especially during okay. pandemic. Yeah, just wanted to add on this, even on our rigs in Africa, we also celebrate their festive seasons. Uh, at one time when the client was Chevron, we also celebrated the uh, 4th of July Independence Day. So, you know, there are some photos um, about us uh, decorating it with the 4th of July with all the Star Spangled Banner and American flag. So it was really cool. Anyways, next is the very difficult topic. What happens if someone is positive uh, on board a drilling rig? Peter, walk us through. Okay. Uh, all right. What happens if a person shows uh, a COVID symptoms, right? So we have to be very careful with this. So they have procedures in place. Uh, thanks to our, the HEC department for coming on with a good plan and to ensure that we all are safe uh, when, when somebody has been uh, showing a COVID system. So as you can see from the picture number one, uh, a person uh, walks into the clinic and uh, saying that he complains cough, fever or shortness of breath, right? So after consulting, so he comes and see the medic. So what the medic does, he immediately, as a precaution, the medic will suit up and uh, with a dedicated PPE prior to enter or see the patient and uh, locks the door to prevent any personal coming to the clinic. And uh, as for the second picture that you can see, the three pictures over there, a temperature will be taken, a COVID-19 questionnaire will be filled up, and a consent has, been, has to be signed by the person himself. So the medic will inform the OIM, uh, the Offshore Installation Manager, and contact the uh, installation, uh, International SOS Assistance Centre for further medical advice. So... And then he'll be informing the uh, chem boss uh, or the catering team to prepare the disinfection and uh, basically because they are the cleaning team on the rig. As you move to the third picture, uh, as you can see, the suspected COVID-19 personnel will be instructed to wear a dedicated PEP and advise him to remain inside the isolation room. So while waiting for the further instruction from International SOS a Center, the medic will attend the person with uh, his basic needs, basically serving uh, medication, foods, and etc. And then also we will continue to do the contact tracing, which will be conducted to find out uh, who has he has been mixing around and how we can uh, trace the people over there. Uh, and then what's going to happen next uh, will be. The disinfectant uh, team will barricade the walkway and the corridor area near the IP's cabin so that uh, other personnel are alert and no one enters the area. So we will disinfect and clean the walkway, uh, corridors and nearby all the IP's cabin. And go to the next slide, sir.
Okay, uh, the disinfection and cleaning team to disinfect suspected COVID-19 uh, patient room as per advice by the medic. Uh, room will be sealed with the uh, notice. And then uh, receive uh, once we receive an update from the international SOS, uh, we will plan to medivac non uh, emergency via chopper. So we'll update the plan to the OM and STO accordingly. And then the ETA of the chopper will be established. Basically, the helideck crew and everybody will be suited up with the special PP. So the medic hands over the uh, with on call paramedic, which will be coming on board together with the uh, helicopter, and then he assists in the case situation. So the medic escort the suspect of the COVID 19 personnel to the helideck area upon arrival, and then basically we we'll see him. So once that's been done, uh, the uh, the disinfection and cleaning team will start to disinfect and uh, clean up the cleaning and also the isolation room. So these are the procedures that we have in place. Can you move to the next slide, huh? Yep. So that was basically the last part. I just want to confirm. So um, the personnel in yellow will have to be uh, planned for demop from the rig, right, uh, Peter? Yes. Correct. Correct. So okay. that's what I would we'll like do to share. Okay, I would like to share some of these uh, experiences for. Okay, when you have a COVID on a platform or on a rig, right, you have to contact trace. That's one thing. But the thing is that what is the impact after? So some of our experiences in the industry right nowadays is, um, it's very um, different in every country. Every country may have their own rules. Some countries may go as serious as uh, you need to continuously take, uh, what do you call, swabbing on the rig. The moment you have swabbing, uh, you find another positive, you have to send another one ashore. Then they will suspend all operations on the rig on the platform as well. Once they shut down the platform, shut down the rig, then everybody starts to get demoralized. Everybody starts to hide in their rooms and all that sort of thing. But every day, every week, they will continue to swab again. And some countries are so strict that they will put there the rule as you need to have two uh, completely free of COVID swaps before they can open back the, uh, what do you call, uh, sign on, sign off channel. So again, stay mentally positive. Uh, you got to keep yourself busy. Uh, you know, uh, these, are the, these are the challenges uh, that COVID brings. Uh, it's a very serious uh, thing uh, because the moment you break a bubble or you contaminate a bubble, uh, you can shut down the whole platform. You can shut down the whole oil field itself. Uh, yep. and, and the consequences of it is, uh, you know, catastrophic for economic, for, for the industry as well. All right. Thank you. All right. So we've touched over the COVID-19 impact. Now we're going to go to the final part of our uh, call today. So again, uh, apologies if we've uh, gone over the time limit, uh, but I really appreciate, you know, everyone who's still here. We're just about 100 people still here. Really appreciate your dedication. So now we're going to go to the general Q&A and sharing session. Um, this is how we're going to do this uh, since we, we, we are running short in time. The three questions are the most common ones that people want to know. Uh, the first question is, is for, for me to answer the second. Uh, Harry, I think you can take over because that's the marine side. Um, and the third question will be the uh, for the general rig crew for Peter to answer. So basically the first one, right? How to become an offshore rig engineer? What certifications are needed? So if you guys went earlier over the slide, I won't be able to go through that now. Um, on the organization chart of a drilling uh, campaign, you need to first understand what you want to be part of. Do you want to be part of the oil operators? Do you want to be part of the uh, drilling contractors? Or do you want to be part of the third uh, party service companies, which are the subject matter experts in technology? So um, for me personally, I work for a drilling contractor company. So uh, my qualifications came from having a strong STEM background. You need to have at least a STEM background in mechanical engineering. Um, the, 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 the only bonus part was that I took a minor in drilling engineering. Um, in terms of certifications, usually uh, the company will provide uh, more training for you. But what will give you uh, advantage towards others is, for example, uh, having an IWCF uh, certificate. Uh, you can go up to level two, I believe, without having to pay too much. A level one should be free. Uh, but eventually to work offshore and be part of operations, you need to be level four. 
IWCF. Uh, other than that, offshore rig engineers is not just uh, dedicated to mechanical or drilling. There is also electrical. There is also uh, materials. There is also marine. So um, that's basically my part of my uh, journey. If you want to know more, you know, don't forget to uh, you know just just keep touch, uh, keep keep in touch, and you know subscribe to my LinkedIn or something. Then we can talk more about our um, uh, about this topic. So uh, Harry, for you. How does the seamen? Uh, what about the seamen? What about marine okay. uh, personnel? So, okay, uh, as I've explained to somebody in the chat group earlier on, if you are a navigation officer type of person, you are open to positions which is uh, in ballast control operator or DP for the semi subs in drilling. But if you are from the ground up, uh, you say, hey, uh, how does the normal person go up to the rig floor, become AD and all that? Well, a lot of them start off with uh, third-party, uh, what do you call it, uh, manning companies. They come in as a catering crew. And once you perform well and you, you, uh, you know, shown your, I'm willing to learn, I'm safe, I'm this and that, I, I'm, I'm eager to go out. Then uh, from there, they can be promoted to painters, painters to rasterbouts, uh, rasterbouts to uh, roughnecks. Even from there, also the cabang-cabang, they are, they are, what do you call it, the, some choose to be watch tenders, some choose to be, crane operators, some decide to go up to the rig floor, become floor man, lead floor man, uh, and then they can climb up to ADs. And if they show a lot of potential, they can go up. So that is the horse part way of going. So you got two ways. If you are saying uh, lifelong learning and uh, experience wise, can you go up? Yes, you can. If you're saying, uh, if I study, can I go up? Yes, you can. By the end of the day, like we, you heard from both our experience, Peter and myself, everything is rezeki. Rezeki meaning that you may be studying one Cabang of uh, you know uh, course of education, yep. but then opportunity comes and uh, you might get. And the most important thing is to be ready, meaning that you arm yourself with knowledge, with skills, with uh, you know if you want to be involved in it, you know, join uh, opportunities like this uh, SPE and uh, you know get get understand where this industry is going. Some of the brightest minds in Malaysia are sponsored or, or you know work in their way up into shells into the patronuses and all that they are uh, you know if you are the studious type there is a road for you if you're non-studious type there's a road for you if you are you know lucky lost i have known people who are air stewards who have become very good safety officers and hse advisors so you know at, at the end of the day um, if you're interested you have to find a way uh, be ready for it when the challenge comes because when the opportunity knocks, my form for me, I was sailing for 10 years. And when the when I finally got on board the rig, I found out that the uh, the career path or the door that opened for me was only open for half an hour. The person before me quit the job for 30 minutes. They gave me a call. I answered the phone and the door closed again. So it's really about opportunity. Rizuki. Um, so I would say if you want, if you, there are many ways to get on to a rig. Some, if you are, if you're from the marine world, you say, I want to be involved in oil and gas. Yeah, you can work on anchor handling vessels. You can work on supply vessels. You can even work on, uh, you know, uh, for those who are like, oh, I'm, I'm very mechanical engineering. I would like to uh, go into this. Yeah, you can go and join the Halliburtons, the Wally Parsons, the Slumberjers, right. all that you can do, uh, you know, pumps. There, there are many, many ways to get offshore. Uh, some okay. to drive uh, diving, you know, there, there are many ways. All right. The next question is for Peter. Um, in the general sense, how can uh, someone, you know, join your team or, for example, work um, offshore, um, you know, bringing out the non-engineering sense, you know? So, the thing basically, uh, uh, Harry has just covered on that, uh, Zaha, seeing it's yeah. still the same. I can agree as well, um, but basically, like like we like we mentioned on the PowerPoint slides we had, uh, it's very important if you guys when we send it over, have a look at the organization chart. That's where you have all the roles and responsibilities available to work offshore. But not just again, we want to emphasize that you know not only the offshore personnel are operating the drilling campaign. We must also remember that there are onshore personnel supporting remotely as well. Um, for the whole drilling program as well. So that is also a very important point to make. Anyways, guys, um, that's all from us. Now we will open up um, the floor to, to, for general Q&As. I know it's 10.35. Um, 
Okay, I'm gonna invite my SPE guys over here um, to help moderate this Q&A. Basically, uh, Liam, uh, can you come back in? Yes. Are you there? Hi, yep. everyone. <laughs> yeah, so for those who have any questions, there are two options. One would be to start your video and you can ask directly or you can ask through the chat box as well. So yes, we are open for Q&A now. So raise your hand, I guess, right, Liam? Yep. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the people who have been participating in the chat. We've been trying to keep the uh, yeah. chat going and answering questions offline yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, got two persons raise hands. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I see someone named Zoom user. Go ahead, Zoom user, if you would like to unmute. You got allow him to unmute now. Oh. I think so. But I think he has been raising uh, he or she has been uh, raising been for yeah, a long so, time. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's um, um what about with the next person, uh Furkan Hasifi. Hello. Hello. Can you hear Hi. me? Hi. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Zaharim, all speakers and all attendees. Uh, I, I think I, uh, I should probably introduce myself first. My name is Furkan Asifi, bin Kamaru Zaman. I'm from University of Technology Petronas. I'm currently doing my uh, petroleum engineering degree. I'm in third year. So uh, I have two questions. Is that okay, Zaharim? Yeah, no, no worries. Go ahead. Uh, all right. So uh, the first question is uh, on the topic. It's quite general. Uh, how bad does COVID-19 actually affect uh, in terms of project timeline? Mm. In terms of project timeline, like uh, how bad are the certain procedures are delayed and from the targeted time and or period? That's my first question. My second question is on uh, my personal goal. Uh, I, uh, as I mentioned just now, I'm in. I'm currently in my third year. Uh, I supposed to go through my internship in September, uh, upcoming September. So I actually applied uh, to go to Sapura, uh, but I I went through the website, crew application, and also Sapura fabrication email, Sapura fabrication in Lumut. Oh. So um. My question is on Sapura drilling. Is there a specific channel for me to apply uh, for internship? Uh, uh, I got it. I got, I got a good answer for you right now. So um, for internship, right, as uh, I've explained to some people, um, generally when we are working in the office environment, we can still take in interns. But general, but nowadays, right, with this work from home. A scenario where we, uh, our offices are working from home. Uh, I happen to work in the uh, head office uh, when I'm not on the rig. So in the work from home scenario, we it's very hard for us to take in uh, what do you call interns because why? One, we, we can't bring interns offshore. There's no insurance cover. Two, we can't give you a workplace to work when we are ourselves not working from office. So it's hard to give you a flavor mm -hmm. of uh, office life. It's, a, it's hard for you to get a, a proper internship at this moment, uh, even with our company. I, I would dare say, uh, until the pandemic normalizes, it's going to be not possible. Yep. Uh, also to add on that, uh, that was the second question, right? Thanks, Harry. Um, Yes, obviously, uh, even for ourselves, we, we also have some insecurities with existing uh, personnel who are currently in, 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 in the industry. So uh, that's one thing also to take consideration. Basically, um, for the first question, um, what was the first question? It was about uh, how, uh, how COVID-19 impacted my project schedule, for example, right? Okay, so um, in terms of project management, which is a really good question as well, because I'm in the project management department, um, there are three things, you know. Uh, basically, the first is um, any sort of production or, uh, or production or fabrication in, in our timeline. The second is the logistics of sending parts to the rig, and third is the mobilization of personnel to to work on the uh, on the campaign. So the two threatening um, items are always the logistics and also the personnel. 
how the way we deal with it uh, differs from company to company. For example, logistics, uh, we will need to always take that as the worst case scenario because that is our driving factor for our projects. For um, the mobilization of personnel, um, this is actually a blessing in disguise for a lot of local employees as well. We will try to look into getting local employees um, to work for our drilling rigs. Uh, it's a bit of a, a, a gap there because uh, uh, we are trying to see find capable local employees to uh, work offshore. Uh, but from now, I can see a lot of um, local OIMs, for example, local barge captains are, are, are coming in to, to, to surf um, uh, offshore rather than having someone um, overseas to come in and serve their quarantine. So basically, uh, it will add more uh, cost into that. So yeah, that's that's what I can answer you now. If you want to learn more, you know, we can maybe touch base later. Uh, if we can. Hope that answers your question actually. Yeah, thank you very much, Za and Harry. No problem. All right, Liam. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. See a lot coming from the chat. Yeah, in the chat, there are quite a few questions. Somebody, uh, I think most of the questions have been addressed by Captain Harry mm -hmm. by replying in the chat. I think many people are mainly concerned with um, how do they join as a drilling engineer, which you, you guys have explained. Well, I, I see a question about, you know, uh, how to become a drilling engineer if you don't have a background in, um, in, in, in petroleum or drilling. I'll, the short answer is, uh, no, you don't necessarily need a background, uh, but it is also a strong, um, f a strong addition to your resume. If you have a minor or a special of, uh, area of special interest in drilling, um, or even petroleum, it will usually bring you to uh, to a more what do you call that competitive uh, CV when when the the the, the uh, HR what do you call that personnel have a look. So um, I saw also chemical engineers as well. I know a chemical engineer who's now a drilling engineer as well. Um, they had no background in uh, petroleum. Um, but you need to understand, back then, there was a boom in the industry, I think before 2012, uh, 2013. So a lot of the multidisciplinary uh, engineers were able to join the petroleum uh, industry because uh, at that point, it was booming. They were hiring anyone, especially mechanical engineers. Now, even mechanical engineers have to be selected because remember, we are channeling a, a filter, right? If you have 10 mechanical engineers, but one mechanical engineer has a, has a what do you call that? A, minor in drilling engineering, then obviously it's, it's easier for the HR uh, personnel to uh, hire them, right? So um, don't be discouraged if you don't have any sort of drilling engineering background. Um, all this, you know, update that through your CV if you've done some sort of training or some sort of, um, you know, uh, certification like the IWCF uh, training is one good example. You can also always go open software uh, for more training with regards to drilling engineering. Okay, hi, Harry here. Um, one of the ways uh, that people practice out here is to get your foot into the door. Once you get your foot into the door, then you have an opportunity to go in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like what Hal Vendry said, I've known Hal Vendry a long time since he was a student in the, uh, in the university. And now he's, he's been with the Petronas and all that. And, you know, um, start small, go in, put your foot in, get yourself into the ground, work yourself from ground up. If you are, you cannot get in this front door, go in the side door, go in another way, go in through other avenues before you find yourself out there. At the end of the day, is the key. Um, you may be studying in this line, but it doesn't mean that you're going to end up in this line at the end of the day because uh, you have to be street smart uh, and be willing to try, be willing to go far and do the things that other people will not do to get the upper edge up. Yep. Right, Liam, any other questions? Um, no. Okay, cool, guys. All right, uh, it's 10.45. Uh, we would like to conclude the session uh, soon. I just wanted to show you this slide here. So basically from our session, I hope everyone um, stayed entertained from the videos and also um, as inf informative as possible. 
Um, we obviously need your feedback um, because this, I think, um, is the first time uh, for for SPE young professionals in in, in the KL section to do a uh, a virtual session for for sharing a technical uh, session or a non-technical session. So please uh, scan the QR code over here to access our survey form. Um, you will, you know, be able to provide your feedback, uh, and we will try to learn more from your feedback and deliver better. Um, a better program in the near future. Uh, I just before we conclude, right? I just wanted to ask Captain Harry, Peter, and anyone in this industry. Okay, this is a bonus question. With what you know now, what is, you know, uh, where do you see yourself in five years? Harry, go ahead. Hopefully, with my house fully paid, then I can give up this job. <laughs> But likelihood of that is not high, so I will still be working. That's a legit reason. But you, Peter. <laughs> uh, Zaha, my boss is in the chat group. I think uh, I would like to take up his job one day. You know? <laughs> oh, habis lah, Mr. Kim. Uh, he crack, crack, new target. He said. Okay, just just for everyone's information, uh, for those of you who are working onshore or going onshore, uh, for those of us who work offshore, right? We spend nearly half of our lives, better one, oh, well, two thirds of our lives. Uh, away from home. So, if you ask us what we want, generally, every sailor, every seafarer, every offshore guy will tell you, "I want to go home," and that that's all we say. But then, for the people who are work working in office, working on land, oh, what you want to do? I want to go offshore. So, at the end of the day, when you reach offshore, you realize that you also still want to go home. So, we tell you in advance, you want to go home. <laughs> and and in addition to that, Harry, today is actually uh, seafarers' day. Uh, what do you call that in in Malay? Uh, hari uh, pelawat dunia. Yes. So again, uh, Harry, you want to say happy Seafarers Day to everyone here? Uh, yes. Uh, so for those of you who are in the nautical marine engineering, uh, uh, happy Seafarers Day to you. For those of you who are working offshore, all of us who are connected to the sea are so-called seafarers as well. Although we are technical crew, not marine crew. Um, uh, Again, keep positive minded. Uh, there are a lot of challenges out here right now. Um, when you do get the opportunity to be vaccinated, I would like to share with you guys. Please go vaccinate yourselves. Vaccinate your loved ones. Vaccinate yes. your colleagues. Uh, encourage each other to be Cap. vaccinated. Break the uh, break the chain of misinformation. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, this thing does not go away. But if we are not safe, we, our careers are not safe. If our careers are not safe, our livelihoods are not safe. So. Uh, encourage each other to get vaccinated when we can. Push your company to vaccinate each other. There is something called PICAS, which is a program with the government for industry, uh, awam and uh, swasta, uh, to gabung to uh, vaccinate the industry for frontlining frontliner crews, including ours. Um, today, through our town hall, I have also found out that our company has pushed for this as well. Um, there are some companies like MMHC, some companies like Petronas have also pushed for uh, vaccination. So, but there will be challenges uh, because inside each company, there will be people who believe in right. other things. Uh, but again, uh, this is looking at it holistically. For those of us who went out to sea, you know, vaccination is something that you cannot escape. Uh, we vaccinated for. Anti cholera. When we was uh, starting six months, six months, we had cholera shots. We had uh, <laughs> yellow fever shots every 10 years. You know, so there are things that you cannot escape. Uh, but it's for the betterment of you. During the first SARS, all of us got our Tammy flu shots without even a a, a vaccine. Uh, but that was all in hopes. That now that you have a vaccine in the in in country, in also in our world, people like starting to become oh, ini dari mana? Ini Yeah, dari China saya tak nak. Ini dari UK saya yeah, saya tak nak. Yeah. Ini agenda Yahudi. Ini agenda apa? So this is um, it's time to be serious for us. Uh, if we get the herd immunity offshore, then our livelihoods can continue. We can go home safe to our families. Oh, yeah. We have all lost friends, colleagues. Uh, you know, in these past few weeks and months, we've seen the people that we care about die. From this, uh, people whom we love at home, families whom we cannot meet because of uh, COVID-19. So it affects everyone. Uh, encourage everyone to get vaccinated. If there's someone message, I would like to give everyone. 
I wish I could clap and everyone here, but that was a great speech on vaccination. Anyways, guys, uh, let's conclude. But before that, please, everyone, open up your video. Um, if you had the virtual backgrounds that uh, SPE sent over on your email, please use up the uh, virtual backgrounds that showcase the life on the rig uh, backgrounds. You know, it, these are really, really, um, what do you call that, rare footages of, of, of pictures of the drilling rig. It would be really cool. So, okay, who's from SPE? Who's, who's going to take the picture? Is it you, uh, Hazik or Aina? Sarah. Sarah, okay. Oh, I think it's... Fatin, Fatin, I don't know how to do the view. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys, open up your videos. Don't, don't, uh, don't be shy. You, you go know. to view, uh, then you go side by side gallery, and then yeah, uh, the there view, will be. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I, I think Zaha can, can. Um, Zaha yeah, can I have to. Sharing your screen, please. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah right, I'll there, there you go. go. Yeah. Okay. And also, there are four pages. Uh, so, screenshot. Next page. Screenshot. Next page. Screenshot. Next page. Okay. Well, we have Anos uh, Junior here as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Everyone has to smile for like five minutes. Okay. Five minutes, wow. Yeah, another long five minutes one. I can see the BCO <laughs> is also uh, online there. <laughs> yes. So we are, we are going to do some inception. So Helvendris is still outside jogging, is it? Okay. I'm trying my best to take uh, like all like page. Okay, I'm on the second page. All right. Smile for like five minutes. I know it's going to hurt your cheeks, but it's okay. <laughs> Hang in there. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Hold on. One, two, three. Oh my God! Oh my God! It's so. This is pressuring. Okay. Hold on. Uh, oh. Okay. Um. I only have three pages. So yes, I have three pages, right? Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. I got it. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our sessions and our sharings. Um, we were we were trying to give you a flavor of the rig, uh, a virtual walkabout. Um, in a sense that we would like to thank uh, Peter and his, uh, his crew for all the good help. Then, uh, you know, uh, generally, thank you for SPE for inviting us. Uh, we hope you guys had a great time and enjoyed our uh, presentation and company. Yeah. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you all. And clap, clap, clap for speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone for coming. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Stay home. Selamat maju jaya. Selamat what well, thank oh, you. Bye. Bye. Oh, it's so cute. Oh, bye bye. Stay safe, everyone. We can everyone. sing together. MCO, MCO. <laughs> okay, so I, I, PKP all. I think we're gonna get another MCO. Yeah, PKP, PKP. <laughs> that's right. Okay. okay. Uh, anyway, good morning, everyone. Uh, we wish you all good night. Hi. 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 Thank you. Okay, great. Great.